seeing Jesus with a kiss. I don't know if you can see it well on your home screens, but the person who did this statue really captured the impudent face of Judas. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Um, uh, about the question from last week, uh, uh, the idea of glorifying God, how do we do that? Um, I once heard an old country preacher talking about how you glorify God. He says, you brag on Jesus. Um, he is the one who has come for us, died in our place, given us a right standing with God our Father, has given us a promise of eternal life, and sustains us and helps us to grow in Christ's likeness in the meantime. And so we simply say thank you. Uh, we give praise, and that is glorifying God. A life of, of obedience and service, that also glorifies God. Um, it's the question, in my mind, kind of carried me back to question one of the Catechism of the Westminster Confession. <coughs> the, uh, the larger catechism asks the question, what is the chief and highest end of man? Um, and the answer is familiar to us all. Man's chief and highest end is to glorify God and fully enjoy him forever. And uh, this next comment is uh, I took from a blog uh, that is done by a Presbyterian pastor. I thought it was interesting. He said to glorify God is our sacred responsibility. To enjoy God is our sacred relationship. Those are two sides of one coin and therefore mutually dependent each upon the other and inseparable. You inevitably will display one when you intentionally embrace the other. He continues, the triune God of glory has made you, saved you, and sustained you for one purpose or end and that is to glorify him and to enjoy him forever. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, your responsibility is to glorify him, and your relationship is to enjoy him. The more you enjoy him, which is your grace given and God's secured relationship, the more you will glorify him. And the more you glorify him, which is your grace enabled and God defined responsibility, the more you will enjoy him. So I found that to be helpful. Um, and I hope uh, perhaps that'll give us a little uh, bit of help with this idea of glorifying God. Uh, let me just share one, one comment. I, I, for years and years, I uh, was a member of the Lutheran church. It was a Missouri Synod church, conservative um, Lutheran body. And in that group, there is a layman's organization, appropriately called the Lutheran Layman's League. And as it turns out, there were two men who worked side by side for over 30 years before they found out that they were each members of sister Lutheran congregations and both were members of this Lutheran Layman's League, which is supposed to be um, a group of men that glorify God and serve him. So amazing that someone could be a Christian for 30 years and no one around you, even someone who's sympathetic and agreeable to your theology, would even know that you were a believer. So I don't know, maybe this idea of glorifying God is being willing to let other people around you know that you are, in fact, a Christ follower and you are willing to give him praise and uh, look to him for grace to help uh, you through this life. It's, uh, I'm kind of sermonizing here, but, uh, but I'm wondering if, if glorifying God isn't being willing to share your faith with others, at least to let them know that you in fact are a believer, you're a Christ follower. Ah, uh, well, um, I, I just wanted to, introduce um, Mark 18. Uh, you know, we have, we've, um, we've studied uh, 
Jesus's high priestly prayer, chapter 17. Uh, and that is uh, immediately followed, of course, uh, here by chapter 18. What was not in the Gospel of John is the account of Jesus's prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, that agonizing prayer where he went again and again apart to pray and that his sweat was like great drops. And in that agony, he had asked the disciples to wait with him. And, and it says that they fell asleep. They fell asleep repeatedly. Uh, and uh, I guess we could have a little bit of sympathy for them because it says they fell asleep for sorrow, but still they fell asleep when Jesus needed them to be awake and commiserate with him in his agony. At any rate, that is, was not covered uh, in the Gospel of John. Conversely, Jesus' high priestly prayer of chapter 17 was not covered in, uh, in the other Gospels. So we need um, all of the Gospels, and uh, I find it very helpful to have a um, harmony of the Gospels where someone has gone through and they've kind of outline portions of each of the Gospels uh, that tell the story, and together all four of the Gospels uh, tell the story of the Gospel uh, more completely. So if you would like to study uh, this in greater depth, uh, you could Google, I'm sure, uh, a harmony of the Gospels, and you would get some help there. So um, back to the statue, in the Lateran Palace, I think that's in the Rome, um, this idea of Judas, who was with Jesus in all of his ministry, saw the miracles, knew about Jesus walking on the water. All of that dramatic experience still did not get into this man's heart. It's just amazing. And so when Judas betrayed Jesus, he betrayed him with a kiss. What a horrid thing. Judas was a thief who pilfered from the money bag. That's John chapter 12. And Jesus' Jesus's own description of Judas from John 17 is that he is the son of destruction, or the King James would say the son of perdition. Um, he agreed to betray Jesus for the price of a slave, 30 silver coins. And uh, when he tried to give the money back to the high priests and so on that had made the deal with him, they, they couldn't take it back. They said, it's blood money. So what a horrid, horrid thing. Well, uh, and so we get to the text that we want to study this morning. Um, for those of you at home who are seeing a, a box with, with uh, a few of the attendees' pictures in them, you can you can catch that box with your mouse and pull it around if it's covering up the text and you if you want to read the text. Um, anyway, when it says Jesus has spoken these words, we in our minds we should include not just the words of the of the high priestly prayer of chapter 17. We should also think of this as words that he spoke as he prayed in agony in the garden. At any rate, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, uh, and there was a garden where he and his disciples entered. Judas, uh, this guy who betrayed him, knew the place. Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there, laterns, torches, and weapons. Uh, what we can see from this is that Jesus, of course, knew that Judas knew. Um, and when that crowd came, they were clanging and banging and with their lanterns and whatever, they would be easy to spot coming up through that Kidron Valley. And um, Jesus and the disciples, had they wanted to at all, could have slipped away through the olive groves and avoided uh, the arresting party, but Jesus didn't run from it. He knew that this was appointed for him. Um, 
And so when they arrived, he walked right up to them uh, and he asks them, whom do you seek? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Uh, and Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. Our brother Buddy uh, was sharing some insight into this passage that blessed me, and I'm sure will bless us all. And, and he's agreed to share with us some, some impressions that he was left with as he studied this. Buddy, would you share with us? Thank you, Grant. Um, as Grant said, he and I were discussing these particular passages during the week um, as we were studying John chapter 18. And you'll notice uh, as you read through the scripture, uh, it's Jesus that initiates the conversation. Jesus says to this band of soldiers who have gathered and to the Jews who've come with him, whom do you seek? And they replied, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I am he. And when Jesus said this to them, they fell to the ground. I've read that so many times and just uh, read right past it. And for some reason, I paused this week. Jesus' reply, I am he. As you read the English translations, that's how that reads. And it sounds more like conversation. But if you notice in Jesus' reply, the soldiers and the Jews fall to the ground. If you go back to the original Greek translation, uh, Christ replies, I am. I think the Greek words are ego emi, I am. And we have added he in our English translations. So you notice uh, the soldiers fall to the ground because of the power of God's word spoken to them. Matthew Henry, Henry's commentary reads, they fall to the ground as if they are struck by thunder and by lightning. And he notes that they fall backwards, not forward. They don't fall forward in a humble position or a kneeling position, but rather they fall backwards. In Christ's reply, I am reference, is, as we have discussed previously in our study of John, uh, the I am statements. And you will remember when Moses saw the burning bush up on Mount Horeb, he went up and he had conversation with God. And God explains to Moses that he will deliver his people from bondage. And Moses asks a question, whom shall I say sent me? And God replies, I am. I am who I am. So what we see here, I think, is in Christ's reply, everyone realizes that he's not referring to being Jesus of Nazareth, but rather he is God. He is a, the living God that speaks, and he has come to deliver his people from the bondage of sin, sin and death, as he has for you and I this Christmas morning, or this Easter morning. I think that's the beauty of those words. Brother Grant? Thank you, buddy. Thank you. That's rich uh, and inspiring. Yes. And so Jesus continues looking at verse eight. If you, I'm, uh, this text that you have on your screen uh, is from the uh, ESV Bible, the ESV and IV, whichever one you use, we're at uh, verse eight in chapter 18. So Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. And uh, verse nine continues, this was to fulfill the word he had spoken of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Uh, we wanna pause there just a moment because we see that Jesus in his high priestly prayer uh, talked to the father and he says, I have kept them uh, uh, in the truth. Your word is truth. Um, and now he commits the care of the disciples to the Father. And we know that no one can take us, pluck us out of the Father's hand. Um, and no one can pluck us out of Jesus's hand. 
I, uh, and the reason I stress that is that we need to have assurance. Uh, and Jesus gives us that assurance. Of those you gave me, I have lost not one. And if we went back to John chapter 6, we would see that uh, expressed there. All the Father gives me will come to me. And those who come to me, I will, you know, I forget exactly what it says there, but it's very assuring that he's going to keep those uh, that the Father gives him. And we are believe who believe in Jesus. We are the ones that the Father has given Jesus. We're a, a gift from God to Jesus. We're part of his people. Um, that's a strange thing to think of us being a gift to Jesus, but uh, God has given a people to Jesus, and we who believe are those people. Well, we, we come to verse 10, and this interesting story of Simon Peter. Um, he, uh, he had a sword, and uh, we know that he had already told Jesus that he was willing to die with him. And the others all said the same thing. You know, uh, it's like the little dog behind the screen door. You know, he'll bark very loudly at the big dog outside. When you open the screen door, he maybe not, doesn't bark quite so loudly. Um, Peter had a good heart, he really did, but he, he thought he had the courage of his convictions, but maybe not quite, because uh, when just this little, um, uh, but well, initially he did, he drew his sword and cut the high priest's uh, servant's ear off. Oh, uh, that, you know, would have really cast a lot of aspersions on any of the message that Jesus had come to bring. And Jesus uh, was quick to say to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. You know, shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? And I wanted to include this uh, passage also from Matthew uh, 26, because it continues that thought, do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? Um, a legion here in the notes is at least 6,000. We know from our reading in the Old Testament that one angel destroyed a force of 185,000 men that had come against Israel. And so if you, <laughs> you want to do a little bit of Bible mathematics, why you could multiply, first of all, uh, 6,000 uh, by 12, and then you could multiply that times 185,000. So you could see how many angels, potential, excuse me, uh, men potentially uh, could be done in by uh, 72,000 angels. And it amounts to twice of the present world's population. So, <laughs> so Jesus didn't have any problem with protecting himself or his disciples had he wanted to use the power of the angels that was at his beck and command. Um, uh, and, but he went willingly to his death. Uh, they, they didn't come to get him and him run from them and they finally caught him. No, he knew they were coming and he waited for them. He knew this was his time and he met it, uh, with great courage. Uh, praise God because that courage, uh, has secured our salvation well, we get to the part here where Jesus is arrested. The band of soldiers, the captain, the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus. They bound him, and first they led him to Annas. Uh, we know that he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas. Caiaphas, obviously, his son-in-law, uh, high priest that year. Ordinarily, high priest was uh, uh, selected for life, but there was a lot of politics in the high priestly business, and Mark Moss has... Uh, done some work on that and he's willing to help us and so mark i'm gonna bring up uh the uh, I'll, I'll PowerPoint that you sent me okay will that will that work yeah i was gonna bring it up too it doesn't matter okay uh well go ahead whatever you wish to do it did uh actually i can't do it without with your sharing so that's fine if you want to bring it up grant okay is it on your screen now um no Huh. Had the had the previous text been on the screen as I was talking? Yes. Yes. Okay. Gee, I don't know. I it's it's on my screen. I don't know what else to do. 
Um, right. Can you stop sharing it up on top and then maybe I'll share it? I'll try it. There, can you bring yours up now? Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll go, I'll, I'll try to go back. I'll try. This is clumsy because I'm not sure how this works. Yeah. Um, pause, share. Stop, share. All right. I think I got it. Let me see here. Uh, There it is. Well, I don't know why I lost my images. Yeah, I see it on the screen. Do you see all the images? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Oh, 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 no, I see only the text. All right, hang on just a second, folks. That is weird. Just a second. Grant, if you could maybe sing a song or something while I'm doing this. Um, maybe do a dance or something. Yeah. This there was where go. Sandy was supposed to sing. Remember, Sandy? You and Yvonne were going to join together with all our other great vocalists. Jenny was going to play the grand piano for us. We're I ready. Frank, Frank should do the bagpipes. <laughs> yeah, we're accompanied by Frank, of course. <laughs> How we go? How about that? Perfect. Awesome. All right. So as I looked at this, the first thing that popped in my mind was kangaroo court. And I thought, well, I don't really know what that means, but it sounded like kind of like a kangaroo court because there's several, several interactions, several little trials going on here. So I looked up the definition of kangaroo court and there's actually two main definitions of kangaroo court. One is that, you know, basically it is a, a, a body that ignores due process and has limited authority. Second definition is one that actually has the authority, but doesn't act legally or ethically. And so as we go through this, I want you to think about um, why I might say that the, the Jewish side was a kangaroo court, and I might even say the Roman side was a kangaroo court. All right, so what you actually see is a timeline. Uh, Grant actually gave me the timeline, I accepted it. I think it's very, very close. So these, the, the uh, uh, times are in purple or, are somewhat uh, directionally correct, I would say. But what you actually see is if you think about what's going on, we're in the, you know, the, the week of where the city is bustling, right? And what we're trying to, and what the Jews are trying to do is trying to, you know, rush to judgment. They're actually trying to get a trial and a conviction and even execution as much as they can before the city awakes. And so the first thing that they do is they take uh, Jesus to Annas. And as Grant mentioned, Annas is the former high priest up until, you know, less than 200 years before this, um, the high priests were the priests for life, right? They, that was a position for life, kind of like, if you guys remember Strom Thurmond in South Carolina, that's a joke for those, hopefully. I don't see Vern laughing, so I don't know. Come on, Vern, give it to me. <laughs> so anyway, uh, they were high priests for life. And at this point, uh, Annas was no longer the high priest. He had actually been deposed by, um, I think, the predecessor to Pilate. Uh, and he was succeeded by four of his sons. But at this point, uh, Caiaphas is his son-in-law, right? So it was Annas, four sons, and then Caiaphas has taken on. So it was odd that they first took him to Annas instead of to Caiaphas. Obviously, that, that shows that maybe Annas was kind of the voice behind or the, the thought behind uh, the position that Caiaphas had. Um, he's obviously had, um, you know, the credibility. Um, but I think there's also a practical uh, reason that they took him to Annas. And if you think about the timeline, think about what that may have been. That's another question I've got for you. Why would they have taken him to Annas uh, other than the out that Annas would have had? But there's a practical thing as well. Annas, Annas questioned him, and then they took him on to Caiaphas. Um, Caiaphas um, would have, uh, he himself would have been the high priest at that time, which means he was the head of the temple. 
and also of the Sanhedrin. Um, now, pre-Herod, the Sanhedrin and the high priests were also the head of the government in Judea, but now, of course, we know that the Romans have come in. And so they take, uh, take him to Caiaphas, and then ultimately they take him on to the Sanhedrin. And again, the Sanhedrin is kind of the Supreme Court of Chief, Chief Priests and Elders. They decide major cases and they interpret the law. And there was just several things that was illegal about this trial that was kind of held here at the night, you know, Passover. So first of all, they took him to Annas's house, which was uh, a private home. It was not a public uh, testimony or a public court uh, where the testimony of witnesses would have come in. And there were no witnesses, right? The, I think Jewish law said where you had to have two or three witnesses. At this point, they've just got Jesus in some private home. And Jesus himself is forced to testify illegally, right? And so the, the Jews are searching for any offense that they can get that is uh, applicable to Roman law uh, because the Jews themselves were not allowed to inflict the death penalty. So they take him to Annas, Caiaphas, and ultimately to the Sanhedrin, where I'm sure Caiaphas uh, was kind of the moderator. Um, and then Luke uh, 22 tells us that uh, they did this as soon as, there, as it was day. So it was some attempt to legitimize, possibly, um, or at least it was illegal to pass death, uh, a death sentence at night. So after they go from the Sanhedrin, now they actually go to the Romans. And so they, they take him to, to Pontius Pilate himself, uh, who's a Roman governor. He actually has the authority to impose the capital punishment. Um, and he is also the one that, of course, appoints the high priest. So he would have appointed Caiaphas. There would have been some relationship there. Um, now, again, the Jew... You know, the Jews are trying to get get Jesus on something that the Romans care about. You know, up until this point, their charges had been blasphemy, uh, which would have been obviously a, a Jewish offense, but it would not have been an offense uh, to the Roman government. So they bring charges of, you know, in uh, of subverting the nation, uh, of forbidding tax payment to Caesar himself, uh, and then pro proclaiming himself king. And so all that is spelled out in Luke. But again, Herod says, you know, um, I've got no, I'm sorry, Pilate says, I've got no uh, legal basis for convicting this man. So Luke tells us that John, uh, Pilate actually sent him over to Herod. And Herod was, you know, he was a Jewish leader, if you will. He called himself the king, but he was actually the king uh, or the son of a Jewish king, Herod. Um, and so he would actually happen to be in town for the Passover event itself. Um, and Herod questions him. He doesn't, you know, find, really get anything, I guess, He's back to Pilate. And of course, at this point, Pilate um, sentenced him to death, even though he didn't find any fault. Um, and so then ultimately what you may not see off to the right hand of the screen is he actually sent him to the cross. So back to the first couple of questions. Um, do you see anything that might have been uh, many reason for us to say that maybe this was a kangaroo court, um, either by the Jews or the Romans or both? And also I'll ask, is there any reason, uh, practical reason that you could see that they may have started with Chi uh, Annas instead of with Caiaphas? I think I'll pause there. Annas because he was the high priest for 17 years. He was the, the wiser of the two. Caiaphas was not as wise according to the story. I think. You're a little bit faint, Vern. Does anybody else have trouble hearing Vern? Yes, we did. I could not hear him real well. Vern, we can't hear you, buddy. Okay. Well, no, it was going to be that good stuff. Several people are showing that they're muted. I unmuted myself. Mary Francis, you're not muted. I can hear you. Okay, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Does anybody have a thought as to why I start with Annas? Practical reason. I think the Jews still recognized Annas as a high priest, since in their minds, Annas was a high priest for life. 
I think absolutely true. That is definitely true. He had the clout, the credibility. Uh, I think you, st you start with him for that reason. But there's also kind of a practical thought, too. And I won't belabor it any longer. But you think about it, they had to actually um, uh, they had to in the middle of the night, they had to round up the Sanhedrin. Right. They had to get the Sanhedrin. They had to get all the elders in and they get everybody in. So Tom's getting all the elders in. Meanwhile, they're starting with uh, Tom Labonte or somebody, right? So there was a re there was a practical thing as well, is that there's they're trying to wrestle it, get everybody up in the middle of the night, and they've got to get this body together. How about with the uh, kangaroo courts? Again, um, two options: uh, ignore due process, have limited authority, or actually have the authority but don't act legally or ethically. Any thoughts there? Mark, I don't think a lot of people hear you. Mary Ferris, just say that again. I don't believe a lot of people are able to hear you. Oh, you can't hear me. Can folks hear me? Yes. Yes, we hear you, Mark. Mary yes. Francis, yours actually you. says on my screen that you yes. have you know, your bandwidth is low, network bandwidth is low on your screen. But I hear you okay. Yes, I've got a medium internet connection. But I hear you. All right. I won't. Sorry, uh, I think we're having a little bit of connection problem. I won't be labored any longer. But of course, you know, you think about all the stuff that Jews did wrong uh, no test, no witnesses. They did it at private home. All these kinds of things would have made it obviously very illegal. And they really had limited authority because they were under Roman occupation. So they really couldn't consider anything that was death penalty worthy. <clears throat> and then uh, the, the Romans themselves, uh, you know, uh, Pilate didn't find any reason to crucify him, but he did it uh, illegally anyway. Um, but you think about it, how else could he have, you know, how else could the Jews and Romans actually crucify a man who was uh, completely without sin? Turn it back over to you, uh, Grant. Okay, great. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, we'll go back. Uh, we'll try to uh, go back to the previous screen. Um, I'm trying to bring this up and it's not responding, folks. Please be patient. There. Um, so we've had, uh, thank you, Mark, for that uh, good information about this trial and how bogus it really was. The charges were trumped up, the procedure was illegal. Uh, Jesus was convicted before they ever laid eyes on him uh they knew what they were gonna do it was not uh you know there's a passage in uh proverbs that says uh in the case of a trial you hear the first witness and uh, if it sounds like uh that's what you ought to believe but then you bring say the defense and let them share their side of the story it's only then when you have both sides of the story that the trial actually begins uh they never got to the other side of the story here in this bogus kangaroo court trial of jesus so it's interesting when we look here at verse uh 14 that um it says it was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews it would be expedient that one man should die for the sins of the people. Um, this was back having to do uh, with the attitude toward Jesus after he had raised Lazarus from the dead. They decided, well, they're going to have to kill Lazarus again and kill Jesus too, you know. So it was, you can see in verse 14, 
that Caiaphas, who was supposed to be the leader, uh, was really extremely biased and really thought that killing Jesus was the way out. Uh, totally political, totally political. No truth in it at all. Um, well, we've come here to verse 15, which is the portion uh, that goes back to this idea of Peter denying Jesus. Um, let's just read the text. Simon Peter followed Jesus. Uh, and I, obviously this is going to take us back to that point before uh, the, the tr so-called trial began. Simon Peter followed Jesus. So did another disciple. We don't know who that is, by the way. Um, uh, since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. Uh, this can be a little bit problematic. We don't know. Some people assume that the other disciple uh, was John himself because John is very um, uh, humble and doesn't speak of himself directly, even when he's referring to himself in the Gospel of John. So some people think that this is the Gospel of John, but other scholars who've studied this say, well, it, you know, it's problematic that uh, John the fisherman would be on such terms with the, you know, with the high priest who lives in Jerusalem, and John and his fellow Galileans are up, you know, up at the Sea of Galilee. Um, so anyway, uh, not to belabor it, but uh, some people have said, well, maybe it was Joseph of Arimathea because he was on the council. And we know that he became a disciple uh, when he uh, asked for the body of Jesus. We know that. Uh, also, uh, uh, Nicodemus was kind of a secret disciple. Um, maybe one of those men uh, uh, gave uh, the word to someone to allow John or, 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 or allowed this disciple to come in or, and so on. But here it is, he, went, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. Peter stood outside the door, verse 16. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door, and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. So... Here we have uh, Peter who said he would go to die with Jesus. Uh, and we have a servant girl just asking him a question. She doesn't have a sword in her hand, but Peter is, uh, he's not quite as brave as he was a moment before. So this would be Peter's first denial. We see the story continuing uh, there in verse 18. They had made a charcoal fire, it was cold. They were warming themselves, Peter was there warming himself around the fire. And uh, in the meantime, the high priest is questioning Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I've said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said. Um, when he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Well, we come now to another denial of Peter. It's a sad thing. We don't want to, uh, to think ourselves superior to Peter. Uh, we would probably have done the same thing in his situation. Uh, all of us need to be very humble about uh, how strong we are. We're only strong because Christ makes us strong. Um, so Peter was warming himself. They said to him, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, says, I am not. And then uh, one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, 
we know that Jesus healed that man, by the way. He touched his ear and healed him. Uh, but this relative of that man says to Peter, did I not see you in the garden with him? And Peter denied it again. And at once, this is number three, uh, a rooster crowed. If we go to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, verse 61, says that at this point, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. Uh, so I'm going to, we're going to pause there. Uh, this lesson will take a little bit longer to complete, but I'll show you this picture of a weather vane, and I'll tell you a little story. Um, my wife, Dolores, uh, and I were shopping with our eldest daughter, and she saw a rooster, kind of a weather vane kind of a looking thing. Um, and she admired it, and so we bought it for her. And uh, the lady at the antique store who was selling this item said, uh, do you know why roosters are on the weather vanes? We said, no. She said, well, it's the sign of Peter. Peter is this cocky fellow who uh, is full of braggadocio, uh, but it depends on which way the wind blows. At one time, he's strong over here, but if the wind blows, he changes his direction. And I didn't know that, and I thought it was interesting. And if you go out on the internet and you Google rooster weather vanes, boy, is there ever a bunch of them. And so the next time you see a weather vane, especially if you see one with a rooster on it, you'll know that that's kind of a reminder to all of us that we're not nearly as strong as we think we are. And uh, when we're with our own crowd, we can be brave. But when we're in the presence of the enemy, we may not be quite so brave. Um, we need to repent of that. Uh, we need to see ourselves in this vacillation of Peter. Uh, at any rate, that's just an image to leave with you in your minds as we close. We will continue next time with Jesus before Pilate, uh, the Roman part of the trial. And we'll read then from verse 28 on down through verse 40, the end of the chapter. Vern will lead us next time after that into uh, chapter 19 and so on. So thank you for your um, patience as we have uh, worked through some of the technical problems here in this Zoom problem. But uh, I think we got to the core of the message. I hope it's been a blessing. Thank you to Mark and to Buddy for sharing those insightful and informational things. Um, we'll close at this point, it's 10 o'clock, and uh, leave you with just another Easter greeting. The Lord bless you this Easter as you contemplate uh, the grace of God in Christ for us. He'll never leave us, he will never forsake us, and he's forever with the Father, our resurrected Lord. Uh, and he has overcome the devil and sin and Satan um, and death. We, uh, we are kept safe in his arms. And it's, we know that's true because the Father would not have resurrected Jesus from the dead if he had not approved of Jesus' life, which was given for us. So we'll sign off there. Uh, uh, time is up, but perhaps people would like to discuss a little bit more. But we do have a little bit of time, I think, before the service begins. But I'll pass it back uh, to uh, Buddy to uh, see how he wants to conduct any remaining discussion. Well, we didn't see any other questions. Are there any questions that uh, folks have? Reverend, Mark, uh, Reverend Moss asked us some questions. That was nice. I was waiting on a pop test, which we didn't get. So, you know, uh, uh, hey, buddy. Go ahead, Mark. Um, as I was going through commentaries, I wish I'd picked this up, but I didn't. Um, but one of the commentaries I read was contrasting Jesus' statement after you got rid of the word he, right? 
well, Jesus was saying, I am. And Peter was saying, I am not. Well, that's beautiful. Thank you, Mark. Yep. Are there other uh, prayer requests that we need to share? I'll, I'll share a praise. Um, a couple weeks ago, uh, through the church email, we put a, a, a man named Rick on the prayer list. Rick was um, not someone I know. Is a lady I work with, her, uh, I think a friend of her husband, actually. I think he was the first, the nurses tell him he was the first uh, coronavirus patient in Charlotte that was put on a ventilator. And he had a rough couple of weeks. I mean, it was really, uh, you know, they had him in like uh, medically induced coma and for his lungs to heal. And it was a couple of weeks uh, before he actually got out of the hospital, but he was able to get out. So, um, you know, thanks for all the prayers uh, for the folks at Bethel. Um, it certainly worked in, in Rick's case, and he was able to come home. We've been praying for a young man at Flat Branch named Phil Bain. And uh, so y'all continue to keep Phil Bain and his mother, Betty, in your prayers. That's great. Do we have other prayer requests? I have a praise. Yes. Ashton called from prison last night to thank me, and he has gone from being very angry, being suicidal, almost becoming a Muslim, to accepting Jesus Christ, and now talks about if and when he gets out of prison, he thinks he wants to be a minister. Praise God. I know that's a, that's a long, mm. long stretch, but keep him in your prayers because he still has highs and lows. And a prayer was answered. He's found a Christian friend in prison and has introduced him to the Christian Library International Bible Studies that we've enrolled him for. So that's good news. Praise God. I have a praise report to my son, or our son's undergrad friend who is a resident up in New York City, got COVID and so did his wife, of course, since they were in the same room. But they both are doing well and he's back serving, you know, helping people in the hospital. So that's a praise report. And we have a praise report too. Our neighbor works at the airport, which he called the Petri dish of C-19. And he and his wife both got it and stayed in for three weeks. And he goes back to work uh, next week for the first time. And they're both doing well and re recovered. So praise God for that. Praise report that Janie's test came back negative as well. Praise God. Mark, would you close us in prayer, please? Yep, sure, thank you. Um, Heavenly Father, Lord, just thank you for this season, Lord. This is uh, it's an amazing day um, for us that know you. And Lord, um, we're so thankful for the empty tomb. We're thankful for that you were resurrected and that, Lord, that someday we will be resurrected. Lord, there's a lot of folks um, around the world that are, struggling and suffering and uh, many with illnesses and other things but um, Lord there's so many that don't know you and so Lord we today we were mindful of the joy that we have um, but we also realize Lord that there are many out there that are so struggling and suffering and folks that don't know you and so Lord just ask that you uh, help us um, spread the joy that we have and that your spirit may um, speak to these folks that are truly truly in need. Uh, thank you for the lesson today. Lord, please bless Tom and all the pastors around the world um, that are bringing uh, a message of hope today. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Happy Easter, everyone. Great being together. Hope uh, we'll see you at 1030 on the online service. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Thank you. Thank you. A joyful Happy day. Easter. Thank you. Thank so you, much. Mark. Thank you, Brent. And thank you, buddy. Yeah. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you much. <laughs>